there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Under the Radar, our podcast that is exclusively focused on advanced driver assistance systems. And I am very pleased to have on the show today, Ryan Gerber, who is a product specialist with Hunter Engineering. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, thanks, Jason. Thanks for having us. Sure. And I'm going to start off with a question I've asked a lot of my guests. What is Collision Repair's number one ADOS need today? You know, Jason, I, I believe that is a need for some simplicity. You know, most of the collision repairers out there are working on many different OEs, and each OE has individual and very detailed things that need to happen for ADAS calibrations or resets to happen in their shop. And, you know, really the question comes down to what do we do when, how do we do it, and then what if we don't have the expertise or the tooling or the experience, all these things come into play. And I, I think that simplicity is, is really the biggest need right now. You know, that's funny you mentioned simplicity. It kind of leads into another question I have. You know, obviously collision repairs are a little bit out of their comfort zone with vehicle electronics and advanced sure. driver assistance systems. What are equipment manufacturers doing to, to simplify ADAS calibration and scanning for, for uh, technicians who uh, may be a little uncomfortable with all of a sudden being asked to be, you know, software engineers or, and computer technicians? Sure. Um, Jason, there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle. You know, you mentioned the technician and the shop, and then there's a lot of people that provide things um, to the industry as a whole. And I think each one of them is trying to play a piece of that puzzle uh, to really build that picture in the end for the technician. You know, traditionally, as you said, um, you know, you had maybe had a service information provider um, and maybe that was about it. And now you may have many service information providers. You may look in many different places for the information that you would need. Um, right now, you know, service information has made some changes. Uh, you know, some of the major providers have kind of made some easy buttons to say, um, but then thing, other things come into play. Um, I may not have a one size fits all type of scan tool. There really isn't one of those, right? So again, what happens when I don't have maybe coverage on that brand new 2024 model that we just got and only an OE would provide something like that? Or what if I don't have the proper target or things of those natures come into play. And there's really been some new players stepping into the industry here to help fill that, that gap. You know, there's a void there and everybody's trying to step into that to help fill that gap because it, it's really pretty wide in some instances. You know, Ryan, there's, there's a lot of misinformation uh, being bandied about out there, whether it's technicians talking among technicians in the shop uh, after hours on, on social media forums. Can you tell me the top three misinformation that you're hearing, uh, uh, whether it's ADAS related, calibration related, scan tool related, uh, vehicle diagnostics, top three misinformation you're hearing out there? Well, I think number one there is, is that all the things that you said right there are leading to that misinformation because there's so many things that just aren't verified. So someone might say, and this would be my number one, um, we need this, we need a 60 by 40 area to complete an ADAS calibration. And really what happens is, is, you know, when you look at the individual calibrations, almost none of them, if any, need a 60 by 40 area to complete that calibration. But what happens is, we just automatically go, hey, I see this recommended space or whatever that is, and it's so big, and, and we get fixated upon that. I think that would be number one. Um, number two is this idea of, of the one size fits all again, where we think we're going to invest in one type of, of information provider or one tool, and it's really gonna do every job. And you know, traditionally a 916 French pretty much fits every 916 out there, right? But what we're dealing with nowadays is not so subtle because every manufacturer is going to have different things that it needs to complete calibrations. So those are my top two. And 
you know, I think the third one really is that something you had pointed out earlier is that um, the collision repair technician was really put into a, a steep learning curve uh, over scan tools and diagnostics and all the things that play into proper ADAS calibrations. And I, I think some of that dense information comes from those three items because that learning curve takes some time. And I know that the, most of the technicians have really been into ADAS for quite some time and learning about it. But again, I think that steep curve, because it's, it's relatively new and, and there is all those social media aspects. And of course, you know, you see people doing things that you wouldn't want done to your car on, uh, you know, YouTube channels and things like that. And then that leads, that, that just, that is the first domino is what it boils down to. You know, Ryan, um, Honda Engineering is one of the most um, premier manufacturers of ADAS equipment. What, I'm curious to know, what is your top seller? What is the equipment uh, that you have to address ADAS repairs that is just flying off the shelves and why? Jason, right here behind me, our wheel alignment equipment is number one. And that is because wheel alignment is critical to the, to the direction of travel of the vehicle. And almost everything surrounding that being cameras, radars, everything else is gonna feed into or be based off that, that travel. So our wheel alignment equipment is really gonna be number one because that's the basis for a, a proper ADAS calibration. And with that, we also provide something called a code link device. And that code link device is really an easy way for a technician to reset a steering angle sensor um, that is, again, that typically that first part of a proper ADAS calibration. Well, and then it's kind of, after that it is, and it, it, it is who are you and really what do you want to do after that? So, you know, if you are a collision repair facility, if you're a calibration facility, general repair, things kind of snowball from there. Um, because as I said, our wheel alignment equipment is, is number one. But then after that, we've got some other tools. So a lot of times manufacturers will recommend a dynamic calibration, which is a driving calibration. So the driving calibrations can typically be handled by a tool that we call, a, call ADAS Link. And ADAS Link is nothing more than a scan tool, uh, a fully functioning scan tool that will give technicians the ability to reset those systems that are dynamic. But then we would might move into that calibration facility or, or another facility, any of the facilities that I mentioned that may want to get into the static resets, which would be the in-bay resets where we would have targets or fixtures around the car. At that point, really what we're looking at is a tool that we call the DOS 3000. And that will actually provide a lot of those targets and fixtures for the technician. And then lastly, you might be, uh, an OE manufacturer, and we have recently come out with something we call Ultimate ADAS, which is a is a, an, a wheel alignment machine first, but then it also, with a guided process through lasers and measurements, will actually help you place those fixtures all around the vehicle. Ryan, am I hearing you say that if a vehicle needs a calibration, you must do an alignment like all the automakers across the board are saying that that is the case? No, by no means am I saying that. That is not a required procedure. But I would say it is, it is a requirement for some after a wheel alignment to complete those, and many more are adding that in as a requirement. Um, but I think from the industry information that I glean, most people who do calibrations especially when we're dealing with a collision event, are at least gonna check that wheel alignment and 80% of the cars rolling down the road that haven't even been in a collision are probably gonna be about uh, eligible for a wheel alignment. So it's just due diligence. You know, Ryan, I think a lot of collision repair facilities wanna do calibrations in-house, right? Because they wanna control the quality of the work the, you know, because they're really, they're repairing the vehicle and, you know, they're taking on the liability and it's their reputation at stake. Um, so they're, from start to finish, they want to control that job. And not only that, they want to save time rather than sending the vehicle out. So what is a shop's best, best path to 
to getting to that point where they can do calibrations in-house? You know, that's a great question. I think every shop needs to approach it uh, in a systematic fashion. And, you know, outside of the equipment realm, I, I believe what needs to probably happen first is a process happen at the shop level during the intake and write up of the car where things are defined, where, you know, a pre-scan is done, um, you know, the VIN is thoroughly scrubbed for what systems would be there, and then what the OE recommends or requires during these times. Then after that, I would say we have some products, um, both, like I said, between our DOS 3000 and currently an exclusive product, the Honda and Acura, uh, our Ultimate ADAS, those would definitely be the best bet. On a scale of 1 to 10, Ryan, where do you think the collision repair industry stands today with addressing ADOS repairs? I mean, are we, um, are we, are we there as far as the equipment and the training and the knowledge of fully there? Uh, are we halfway there? Or are we just kind of still dipping our toes in this and learning? You know, Jason, I'd like to think that maybe we're halfway there, right? Um, in other words, I, I don't think you're going to go to many quality shops and say, my car has ADAS, and they're going to look at you like they don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I do think that there are still quite a few shops that think maybe it'll go away, maybe we should sublet this forever, um, that may not be worried about some of the things that you were talking about as far as quality or cycle time or liability. So, you know, I think the numbers would vary a little bit. I, I but I would be hopeful to think that at least halfway there, because there are service providers out there and associations and training providers really trying to make a path for, free, for all of these technicians and shops to be ready for these cars when they come in the door. And they are coming in the door currently. So I think that uh, right now, like I said, I, I would hope that it's half. I really think it's a little less, but I'm an optimist. Ryan, let's talk a little bit more about space requirements. I think there's some confusion there because, you know, we hear there's like a minimum amount of space you need, and then there's more space you need if, if say, you're doing a 360-degree camera calibration on an F-150, for example. But but tell, talk a little bit more about these space requirements. Sure, Jason. So I, I saw that you brought up the uh, F-150 space requirement. That's one of the larger ones. And I think what we need to look at is each one of these calibrations individually. When you break them down individually, the space is not that, that terrible. And when you look at the space that most collision repairers would have, as far as mobile welding booths, mobile prepping stations, things of that nature, we can actually, as an industry, we could go and say, hey, I know when I get this particular job in, because we've had it, we understand it, we've looked at it in that process, we can say, hey, I understand that I need to move some welders or maybe that prep station. And every toolbox I've ever seen is on wheels. So we can move things out of the way, make that space for those larger ones like that F-150 that, that you um, referenced. But typically, we're not gonna be doing every single calibration at one time. So when you think about that, that 40 by 60 or the, that really large area, that would be if you were calibrating every sensor on the car, right? And that would just mean that you put the vehicle in one spot and it never moves. So typically, number one, you won't be doing all of those calibrations at one time. And then if you did have to do all of them for whatever reason, there is, there is enough of a return on your investment of time and equipment to maneuver the vehicle within a smaller space to get all of those calibrations complete. So I think when you look at what the calibrations mean as far as a revenue stream and really thinking what I, what I call um, thinking inside the box, if we have that box, how could we particularly move the car in that box? There's a lot of ways that we can actually complete those. And I would say that Hunter Engineering on hunter.com, we have some great reference how you can take a smaller space and maneuver the car within it and accomplish all of these calibrations. Ryan, I want to ask your opinion on the calibration center trend. There seems to be more and more standalone calibration businesses being opened up um, separate from collision repair facilities that are strictly dedicated to ADAS calibration. 
and they're quite um, impressive facilities. Um, what is your take on that trend? Well, Jason, I, I would never want to discourage any entrepreneurship. Um, but what I would want to encourage is um, the collision repairers looking at their own facilities because when we talk about moving vehicles uh, outside of the collision repair space, we could potentially add liability and also potentially add to um, cycle time. Those are some really big key words that we hear in the industry, that liability and cycle time. And I, I, I think that we could, as a collision repair industry, do a lot better with, with what's there. Although right now, as I spoke to earlier in one of your questions, there are some people filling those voids and those gaps. And I think right now that's probably the best way to go while the industry continues that other half gearing up to be able to, to really do what, and accept these new technologies. Ryan, talk to me about the OEM recommendations for calibration. We're constantly hammering um, home to our readers that they must follow the OE repair procedures when it comes to calibration to the letter. I mean, there's no wiggle room. And they're very specific sometimes, but they have to be followed. Um, talk to me about that aspect of doing a calibration. When you look at OE recommendations and requirements, there's two different things there. And the requirements is what we're really looking at. And the reason that those are there is, again, to limit that, that repairer's liability so you did everything to the letter of the law that the OE said. As well as there may be things that we don't know about the pieces or parts that we're calibrating that, these, that some of these requirements play into. So that's why it's really, really important because you could potentially fail a calibration or have a calibration that was not done properly and you might not know that until it was too late. That, and if you do everything to the letter of the law, follow all of the requirements, that really sets you apart from everybody else, number one. And number two, it helps limit those liabilities in the event something didn't go right. Well, Ryan, I really want to thank you for being on the podcast today. You know, the collision industry is really thirsty for more information about ADOS, which is a new frontier. And um, uh, you provided some great tips and information today. So I want to thank you. Well, thanks for having me, Jason. And I would love for all of your viewers to know to go to hunter.com, contact your local rep. They can give you as much information as I gave you and even more resources. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Ryan. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this episode of Under the Radar. For more episodes, visit bodyshopbusiness.com.